So this study, they took some people and they did a plant-based diet and an animal-based diet. So they had a group of people that ate the standard American diet. They split them off into two groups. Half ate the plants, rice, lentils, beans, fruit. So this was a whole food plant-based diet. The other half, animal-based diet. So they ate eggs, bacon, pork, beef, cheese. Notice there's no fiber on the animal-based diet. No vegetables whatsoever. They took these individuals. Five days is all it took. They watched them, observed their dietary patterns, and they found a few things. This is a busy graph, but this is to illustrate that, as expected, a plant-based diet here on the upper left was very high in fiber. The animal-based diet, almost zero fiber intake. Moving down the fat intake, plant-based diet was a low-fat diet. Animal diet was a high-fat diet. And then you take a look at protein intake. In the plant eaters, it was about, as expected, 10% or so. And the animal-based group was very high. And what they did with that is they took a look at their microbiome. The plant-based subjects had a healthier microbiome with more diversity. The group that ate the animals, they had a really unhealthy balance. They had bacteria that had fermented, and they'd produced all these chemicals in their colon, two of which were linked to cancers, liver and colon cancer. They also found that there were compounds in the gut that promoted inflammation. And as I talked about, inflammation is the root of so many chronic diseases. If this isn't evidence enough to go plant-based, I don't know what is. So remember, it took five days. And actually, you start to see changes in your microbiome after 24 hours of changing your diet. So let's talk about prebiotics and probiotics. Probiotics. This is the definition by the World Health Organization. So viable microorganisms that, when ingested in a sufficient amount, can be beneficial for your health. So these are actual organisms. Probiotics include lactobacillus, which is probably the most common, bifidobacteria, saccharomyces, which is actually a yeast, but it's still a probiotic, and then there's thousands more. So we can find these in whole foods. We can find these in commercial formulations. You can take certain supplements. A word of caution on that, you need to be really careful about probiotic supplements what you find, whether there is enough colony-forming units, whether there's enough variety, much better to get it from whole foods. Mother Nature makes the best, best probiotic. And what happens is with this prebiotic as well, so human breast milk has HMO. HMO stands for Human Milk Complex Oligosaccharides. And these HMOs, they promote growth and colonization of good bacteria in the gut. This complex, this HMO complex, we used to not know what it did. It was this weird complex in the milk that the, feed, the infant never really digested. It came out largely unprocessed. It was an insoluble fiber. We didn't know what it was for until scientists found that it was food not for the infant, but for the infant's gut bacteria. And what it does is it promotes very healthy, happy gut bacteria. So whole food examples of probiotics. These are the ones that you want to include in your diet, except for one, maybe two on there I'll talk about in a minute. So we have kimchi, sauerkraut, rejuvelac. Rejuvelac is a fermented grain, miso, kombucha. Anybody heard of natto? Natto is this Japanese specialty. It's a fermented type of soybean. It's very stringy. It's kind of hard to eat, but it's so healthy for you. It's so full of probiotics. And there's kefir and yogurt. And I put these in because everybody thinks of yogurt as the ideal probiotic. You see it all over. It's marketed in the grocery stores. We know from Dr. McDougall, Dr. Esselstyn, all of the experts that the dairy products, the casein, they are so terrible for you. The cancer promoters, it's not worth it. To getting a few probiotics from that is not worth the risk of taking in the other bad compounds that are in yogurt and dairy products. So prebiotics. The definition of a prebiotic 
is a dietary fiber that's selectively fermented by beneficial microbes of the intestine. So it's a fiber that your gut bacteria use for food. Characteristics are they cannot be digested by the small intestine. They have to go through your small intestine largely unchanged. They need to be used as fuel or fermented by some colon bacteria. And then they have to produce health benefits by objective measures. Those are the requirements in order to be called a prebiotic. So not all fiber is a prebiotic. They're not interchangeable, but most prebiotics are high fiber foods. So a summary of these health benefits, there's so many, I couldn't go into them all in detail, but they improve and stabilize your gut microbiota composition. So it's going to select for the good bacteria in your gut. It improves your intestinal function. It does this by bulking up your stool, makes you more regular and more consistent. It increases mineral absorption and improvement in bone health. So prebiotics, the way that they are fermented in your gut, they make calcium and magnesium more absorbable and more available to your body, which in turn gives you stronger bones. And then they modulate your energy, and they also make you feel full. A lot of these high fiber foods, they do make you get full with a lot less caloric intake. More health benefits. So they're going to modulate your immune function. They're going to improve your intestinal barrier, that one single cell layer barrier, they improve that. They're going to reduce your risk of intestinal infections. Remember how we said, if your body is stocked with good bacteria, there's no room for the bad and dangerous bacteria. They reduce your risk of obesity, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome. They reduce intestinal inflammation, which in turn reduces inflammation in your body. And then we also know that they reduce your colon cancer risk. So where do these prebiotics act? There's two prebiotics that are the most commonly studied and most of the papers are written on them. They are oligofructose and inulin. So oligofructose acts on our right colon. So the right colon here is the beginning of our colon. And we know that as you go through the colon, your bacterial populations change. The inulin acts on your left colon, which is the side of your colon that's closer to your rectum. We want to make sure that we eat enough prebiotics and a balanced amount of prebiotics to feed all of the bacteria in our gut, not just one side versus the other. Most studied prebiotics, as I said, are the inulin and oligofructose. So examples of inulin would be chicory. I'll talk in detail a little later about that. Asparagus, onions and leeks, bananas, beans, potatoes. So these are all very good sources of inulin. Oligofructose is going to be jicama, oats, barley, rye, Jerusalem artichokes, and beans. So on this chart here, beans are kind of both types of prebiotics. They cross both types. So they feed your entire colon. So the superstars for prebiotics, chicory root, you want to eat it raw if you can. Asparagus, again, much better prebiotic function raw, although there is some benefit cooked. Sugar beets, wheat, onion raw or cooked, garlic, dandelion root or dandelion greens, raw is always better with these, bananas. Interestingly enough, underripe bananas are better prebiotics when they're green just starting to turn yellow. Jerusalem artichokes, again, raw is better, beans and jicama. One thing they all have in common is fiber. Fiber is where it's at. So I'm going to touch on fiber just for a quick minute. Most Americans on the standard American diet, so they consume an average of 14 to 18 grams of fiber a day. 14 to 18 grams. That's not much at all. Doctors recommend 25 grams for women, 38 grams for men. The average American consumes 53% less fiber than is recommended. And in my opinion, these recommendations for fiber intake are too low. We need to be taking in much more fiber than even what doctors are recommending. 
we consume 85% less fiber than our Paleolithic ancestors. Our Paleolithic ancestors, the ones where I showed you the poop a while back, they took in over 100 grams of fiber at least every day. So how can we get some more fiber 